Welcome to WebRTC Live. In WebRTC Live, we cover the latest technical topics and business use cases for WebRTC and live video. As always, this episode is brought to you by WebRTC Ventures, leading integrators of WebRTC video into your custom application. Welcome to WebRTC Live. I'm Aaron Syme, CEO and founder of WebRTC Ventures. WebRTC Ventures is a custom design and development agency focused on building live video applications. We're here to t- help you take your application live. Today's WebRTC Live is a little bit different format than usual, as you, you may notice, a little different setting here. Uh, and uh, we have multiple guests, but really excited that those guests are here in person uh, with us as well. So uh, thanks for joining us live today on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitch, and anyone watching a replay of today's event as well. For those of of you with us live, you can ask questions throughout the stream by leaving a comment in whichever platform you're viewing this. So in this very special episode, I have three of my colleagues at WebRTC Ventures here with me. First on my left here, we have Justin Williams, Senior WebRTC Engineer, Mariana Lopez, our COO, at Weber TC Ventures and Alberto Gonzalez, our CTO at Weber TC Ventures. So thanks for joining me, everybody. It's great to see you all in person. Great to have you here at our Virginia office. Yeah, sure. Thanks Thank for having us here, Aaron. <laughs> We're really happy to be together live. It's always fun to be together and, and awesome that it kind of timed with us doing this event. Um, what we're going to do today uh, for, for the topic is Each of my guests has a short presentation that they're going to share. And so over the course of this episode, you'll get three different tips on things that we've learned at WebRTC Ventures about building video apps. So a few different perspectives of technical and design here. I think it's going to be some really interesting content uh, uh, packed into this uh, from a, a variety of perspectives that we've built up since, you know, building applications since 2015 in this space. Uh, across all sorts of different use cases. So I uh, hope you'll stick around and definitely stick around until the end of this episode as well. We have another special little treat. Uh, one of our engineers, Hector Zelaya, had a conversation with ChatGBT and they wrote, wrote and composed a song together about WebRTC and building things live. Uh, so make sure you stick around for that uh, at the end as well. So let's start with uh, Justin first. And Justin, going to talk with us about custom video streaming with WebRTC. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about custom video streaming with WebRTC, uh, in particular, streaming from a remote host uh, into a WebRTC SFU or WebRTC session. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is kind of the solution overview and it has a, a bunch of different uh, uh, very helpful mechanisms that kind of come out of this. Uh, so essentially what we're doing is we are taking a remote host, some server hosted somewhere, even on your laptop, and we're streaming media or any content uh, into a WebRTC SFU. Uh, and then the way we're doing that is uh, we're using the Puppeteer API to control and load a WebRTC application. In this case, it's going to be a browser that is loading this application, uh, preferably Chrome. And what we're doing in there is now we're loading a web app that is created to integrate with the existing infrastructure that you have uh, and then stream into the WebRTC SFU. And this kind of works with kind of a few different approaches, whether you're using like a CPaaS or you're using an open source custom solution, this will work for both of those. Um, and essentially by using Puppeteer to load a web application, you're kind of getting a lot of control in what you're doing and we'll kind of take a look at that. Um, but then we're also going to be using within the browser that's within Puppeteer, that's within this remote host, um, we're going to get a lot of control over what we can do. Uh, and I'm just going to use the Canvas APIs, but there's tons of different approaches that can be used too. You can use things like web codecs. Uh, or you can stream out of the browser into something else as well. But I'm going to just be looking at Canvas APIs for simplicity. Next slide. So here's kind of what we're looking at. And uh, it's what this kind of gives you, which is actually really nice and what makes it fun. Uh, at least when you start off, you're kind of almost starting with a greenfield application. So you're taking your existing infrastructure that you have your main application with, uh, and then you're building almost a new application. But the fun nice thing about this is that you're only focusing on what you're streaming 
into the WebRTC SFU. So for example, your main application probably has a database, it's probably referencing things maybe S3 for object storage and, and other types of media. And this application that you're building, uh, it can pull from all of those and essentially be a very interactive application. So uh, what you kind of see here is there's probably a tons of different ways that you can look at this diagram, but you can maybe envision that what you're seeing on the right hand side is this is what a viewer is seeing. So maybe they're seeing some streams from the users in the main application. But then now what we're doing is that we're taking that and we're composing it together and we're putting custom content into that. Now, the bottom left of that image, you can see it's kind of hard to see, but those are actually some buttons that maybe a viewer can click. And then that will talk to this host uh, or this Puppeteer API web application. And then we can kind of change the content that's being shown there. Um, so this has a lot of nice use cases. So, you know, you can have very interactive contents or, or broadcasting, which this is really good for, um, you know, composition as well too, it, bringing multiple uh, video streams from the SFU into one video stream. Uh, that's done kind of nicely because the browser experience and developing WebRTC applications, it has come a long way in it and you can really do a lot. And then you can almost imagine what you can do with a web application, you can then take to this host and then stream it as one video. Next slide, please. Um, so then this has a, a lot of different benefits and, and the main thing that you can kind of get out of this too is because you're deploying it in one host, uh, you can almost uh, you can determine how to deploy this in a containerized way. So you can containerize the server, containerize the, the which has the puppeteer code and the web application code. And this is in, let's say, a Docker container that you can run pretty much anywhere. And that has a lot of benefits. So you know, one example is that uh, you can deploy this locally uh, for testing. Normally, when testing WebRTC applications. Um, say you have just one developer working on it, uh, that developer will probably have to load up two to three instances of a browser to uh, you know test different streams in the application. And that can be really intense on that, uh, that local device or the machine that the developer is working on. Um, with this approach, what you can do is that you can run it locally, of course, but that will have the same implication. However, you can then take that containerized application, deploy it maybe to cloud infrastructure, and now you can test as many uh, instances of this as, as you'd like. Uh, and so that makes it a lot easier to test you know, high scale. Um, and then another thing too, is this actually, depending on how you deploy it, you can deploy this in a very reliable way. Uh, you can deploy this maybe very close to the SFU, probably in an environment that is you know, with a high speed internet connection that's very reliable um, and if, say maybe you can do multi-region deployments as well. So say the, the region that you're in goes down, maybe you can spin it up somewhere else. And now you have a reliable uh, connection to your SFU. And so, you know, one example of that is that uh, say you're broadcasting to a large number of users, maybe the, the users that are in the video conference, they just lose their internet connection. But this SFU maybe because it's reliable and, and very available can be deployed somewhere else. And then you're always broadcasting something into the SFU for viewers to see. Um, so there's kind of like a lot of different uh, use cases that kind of come out of this, um, but it's it's a really fun and kind of a interesting uh, approach to getting custom content into a SFU. Um, you can also think about, well, maybe this might not be uh, very efficient. There's tons of optimizations you can do. You can um, maybe use like a lower level service. Maybe you want to use something like Pion to, to get the stream composition into the SFU instead. But what this approach, why this approach is really nice is uh, you can of course optimize in other ways, but because you're integrating with your existing application infrastructure, it makes developing this uh, really easy and you have so many tools available based on like what your main application is doing. You can do those same things in this uh, Puppeteer web app. And yeah, that's, that's the high level presentation. Thank you so much, Justin, appreciate it. Uh, for those of you watching us live, uh, feel free to put in any questions into the comments uh, of the platform you're watching and we'll ask them anytime throughout the broadcast. So, Justin, I think this is a really cool uh, topic for us to discuss, so thank you for sharing it, it with everyone. Uh, the uh, composable broadcasting, I think is an interesting example of how we can go beyond 
just having video in an application, right? And and the benefit of building something really custom instead of using an off the shelf tool. Uh, so I think that's really cool because you've got the ability to build a workflow that, you know, in the past, maybe someone had to do with a, a tool like OBS and having really complicated production process, uh, you know, on site and part of the event. And now when you've got, whether it's for a corporate event or an in-person conference or a hybrid event, whatever the use case might be, you've got a way that you can build in that really uh, simpler to use workflow, right? And build in what you want into that broadcast. Mm -hmm, most uh, definitely. Yeah, so I think that's a really cool architecture. I appreciate you sharing it with us. Um, I was, can you take just a moment and talk a little bit more about how you have done testing against that? You mentioned that being uh, you know a little bit easier with this architecture, I think, and testing at scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, um, it, it just basically gives you the ability to stream content into a WebRTC SFU, which is already very resource intensive from a remote host. So that's not gonna strain your device. And uh, it allows you, you know, you can scale this up to say maybe stream 100 streams into your application and see how that renders mm -hmm. uh, from the developer's point of view. Maybe there's optimizations that they'll never be able to test on their own device, or maybe they'll have to ask, you know, 20 different people, hey, can you load up four instances of this application on different browsers? But with this, you kind of have a lot of control into what you want to stream and how many streams you want to have. And it just makes testing a lot easier too, because, you know, if you uh, script this into something that's like easily uh, runnable, you can like quickly say, you know, bring up five, five instances of this, makes testing and that feedback cycle a lot quicker. Yeah, that's great. All right, let's go to a question or two from our live viewers here as well. Uh, and this could be a question for anyone who, who wants to take it in the group here. Uh, Kong asks, does WebRTC support React and React Native for cross-platform window to Android app development? So let's talk about. Let's start with maybe the first half of that question. Yep. There, you know, React and React Native. You know, can you use how do how do how do you use React or React Native with WebRTC? I mean, it, you can use those languages with it, right? So maybe just talk a little bit mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, well, I I think you know these web application frameworks like React have come a long way and are very sort of uh, I guess diverse in terms of like what you can do with them and based on like how they how how nice they are to use and how well they work with complex state and complex things makes using them with WebRTC actually a lot nicer to do. Yeah. I mean, in general, right, like WebRTC, you could use it almost with any programming language or any, certainly any JavaScript-based framework. Um, if you're using a commercial platform, they may have different support for different platforms. Mm -hmm. um, Alberta, what about like React Native and, and then specifically, it, it sounds like in Kong's case, wants to uh, get to an Android app at the end of the process. So you talk a little bit about React Native and WebRTC? Yeah, that's definitely possible. And then React or React Native, they are just yeah frameworks used uh, using JavaScript, but you would need to use the lower level WebRTC APIs for it. No? So at the end of the day, um, this C++, you know, WebRTC API can be embedded in any platform. Today it has been embedded in Electron, React Native, Android, everywhere. So, yeah, it's it's supported. You no, know, it's possible to do it, but it's not straightforward in some cases. React Native, for example, uh, particularly React Native has a library that is open source that uses, that is based on the WebRTC library but it's not fully up to date or you, you need to make sure it's up to date. You might need uh, to fix some specific bugs. I mean, it's open source. So that's that's something to consider, but yeah, it's it's possible. Yeah, possible, but proceed with caution. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and I would, you know, just add on to that too, if you're looking at a different, uh, you know, commercial CPaaS media service solution or an open source media uh, project, uh, media server project, they have varying supports of like React Native AP, uh, you know, SDKs themselves. And so, you know, that may be a factor uh, trying that out before you make that architectural choice. Uh, all right. Uh, let's go next to Mariana. Mariana 
is going to talk to us about the UX side of things. So Mariana is our COO at WebRTC Ventures, but also has a, a strong background uh, in UX design uh, and has worked with many of our clients on that as well. And this is one of the things that you know is really important that that we bring at WebRTC Ventures and is really important to consider is not just what are the what's the architectural choice I'm going to make of a CPaaS or an open source uh, solution, but also to think about the use case patterns, right? The, the usage patterns in our applications, uh, because it doesn't matter how well it works if you can't figure out how to use it, right, Mariana? Right. It has to be a good experience. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about delivering great experience in WebRTC apps and some of the things that we learn and that we try to incorporate in all of our projects to make sure that when you're using this, it, it really is a good experience. And we're going to talk a little bit about it being seamless and intuitive, receiving clear and timely feedback, optimizing for differences, conquering the tricky terrain that is, you know, network bandwidth um, and connecting with other people. And then finally talk a little bit about privacy. So Aaron, if you want to go to the next slide, when we, when we talk about being seamless and intuitive, um, technology is great and all the amazing things that we can do with WebRTC, but we want to try to always be human centric and understand that the focus of the experience should be on that communication collaboration that's happening with people. And how can we make that be the star of the show, make it be the important bit and have the interactions be seamless, be almost invisible, and I'll allow you to focus on the experience, allowing users to interact without a distraction. And what I mean by that is controls for muting, sharing your video, sharing your audio, sharing your screen, um, looking at other elements that you bring in should, should be should be so easy that you don't even think about it. The choice of icons that you use, right? You don't want somebody to think they're muted when they're sharing that audio. That's going to be a terrible experience for you and for everybody in the call around you. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, clear and timely feedback. So whenever we talk about you know web design or application design, feedback is important in any application. But WebRTC requires just thinking about it in a next level because you don't only need feedback on your state, you also need feedback on the people that are all connecting with you. So is somebody trying to join the call? Is somebody muted? Is somebody sharing their video or not? These are kinds of things that you also have to give feedback on because they make or break the experience. You need to have those visual indicators or audio cues if you're if you're doing a web or an audio call uh, to let the user know and others that you know you're connected that you're experiencing technical issues all these feedback things are going to make the, or break the experience when we've done proof of concepts really small applications that we're just testing out one of the most typical things that we find is people saying like oh the app is buggy or it's not working properly and when we go to debug, when we go to test it out, it's because they're having network issues or they're having problems with just the nature of this being a live um, application. And when you don't give feedback, when you don't tell users, hey, you're, you're experiencing a bad network connection, what they assume is that their bad experience is due to bad programming or bad implementation when actually it might just be the conditions of where you're connecting from. If we go to the next. Uh, application. The next thing is optimizing for differences. So people are going to be connecting with different network connections, with different bandwidth, uh, different quality of what they're seeing. And you have to optimize for that. You have to account for it when you're building it. You have to think of how do we downgrade the quality if your network isn't great or how do we show um, somebody sharing their video in a mobile device on a desktop computer. You want to make sure that you account for that in different viewports that you also think about, well, I might be looking at myself in a square, but am I sharing just that square? Or am I sharing the entire rectangle and am I sharing things in my periphery that I don't want to share? So I think that that's really important when we're trying to show you what you're sharing. Um, and then finally, when we talk about differences, it's really important that not all users are the same. Our end users can come from all walks of life and we have to think about accessibility. And especially in video, how do we incorporate that in? And there's 
really a lot of great technology that can help us empower that, for example, live captioning that you can add in and you can, you know, make sure that everything's accessible. Uh, conquering a tricky terrain, I've, I've mentioned this, but you know, you have to, to enable a great experience in WebRTC, you have to think about everything that will go wrong because it will. Um, so people having issues entering a call, giving, um, you know, just permissions to your mic, to your video. Uh, how do you make it? How do you make that a great experience? How do you make a great experience to reconnect after a failure? If you receive uh, a phone call and you're using your mobile application, how do you connect back into that video call as well? What happens if your connection drops? How you let people uh, give feedback to you and to the, your participants in the same call that that happened? If there's gaps in audio or video because of a choppy connection, um, if from all of a sudden audio is not being shared, these are just examples of things that have happened um, to us and that we need to design for that. And we need to make sure that we work with engineers to deliver great experiences, even if you are experiencing network issues. Um, the next um, and final part of it is whenever we're talking about video applications and audio, uh, there's a really important component, which is part of like human uh, concerns, which we need to think about. And the table stakes of what you can do in WebRTC is so great that we can now start thinking about this, but it's privacy is, um, you know, reducing audio noise am I only sharing the audio that I want to share or are you hearing everything that's happening around me? Same with like background options, right? Can we remove uh, or blur your background? You don't necessarily want to give somebody entire access to your context, but you would still want to have that video call. Managing the devices that you're connecting to. So do you want to connect with a front camera, a back camera? Um, all of this is really important for privacy. As well, I would always recommend adding in that waiting room experience where you can check your audio, check your video before you join that call. And that also allows you to have like that extra security of who's joining your call. You don't want unwanted participants. We all heard of terrible experiences <laughs> from people like joining something that they were not supposed to. So um, those are just some of the things that we consider. Um, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Mariana. Again, uh, uh, for those of you watching us live, it's a great time to put in any uh, questions that you have into the chat. Uh, I have a couple uh, first for you here, Mariana. Uh, I think uh, I really appreciate the point you make about um, that, like when someone's having technical difficulty in a call, it, it may not be a problem with the application, but that user of the application will tend to assume that first, right? I mean, one benefit of, of the, the dramatic growth in people using video conferencing tools in the last couple of years is that in a way, actually, people are much more accepting of problems in a call now than they probably were four or five years ago, because as people have been forced to work from home more and, and adapted to remote work, they've become a little more accustomed to hearing somebody's dog or child in the background right. or seeing you know a, a messy kitchen counter behind the video or something like that right so in some ways we're much more accepting of 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 things like that as well as that the signal maybe is dropping but i think it's still a very inherent reaction to first assume that this is a problem in the application so in addressing that we want to not only make the life of the user better that they know that hey this is a problem you can fix right but also you know us in this room around this table, most of our viewers on WebRTC Live, you're out there building applications. And if they think it's your fault, they're going to make your life miserable telling you that, right? Right. <laughs> so this is also kind of like UX for us in a way, right? The, more, the better we can make the user's life, the more it helps us as well, right? Definitely. And also helping people like troubleshoot them troubleshoot their experiences as well as part of delivering that good experience. Because if you tell somebody, hey, um, you, you're you speaking, um, but your microphone is muted, for example, that right. can alleviate some of like those issues where you're like, hey, hey, your, <laughs> your mic is muted. I think 
Um, same with like network connection. If you tell somebody, hey, your signal's poor, um, they, they might be able to switch networks. They might not be able to do anything about it, but it is definitely better knowing that that's happening mm -hmm. than wondering like, why am I having a bad connection? Is it because the application is buggy? Is it because uh, the other person has bad connection? So the more feedback that we can give, the better your experience is going to be. And definitely also the better impression of your application they're going to have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the it looks like you're speaking, but you're on mute is one of the most important <laughs> cues that I know I run into regularly uh, and is a tremendous help to me. I also think about, you know, as we can integrate more, uh, you know, AI and ML services into our video live stream and analyze the video on the fly, it can also help us with things like, oh, it looks like your background is dark. Consider turning on a different light or do you want us to apply a filter automatically to try and you know improve the brightness of your video stream, things like that could be helpful as well. Um, one other area that you touched on, I want to also ask you to expand on a little bit is waiting rooms, um, because this is an underlooked area of applications, I think, for, for a lot of our clients and in general. It definitely as a minimum best practice, you know, you want to have that that pre-call check. I want to check my hair. I want to make sure that the microphone is correct, yeah. right? Um, that I'm using the correct camera because many of us have multiple cameras uh, on our device too, right? So those things are really important, checking the bandwidth. Um, what, you, what other things have you seen or thought about that um, could incorporate into a waiting room to help the user's experience while they're waiting to join the call or while they're waiting maybe for the doctor uh, to visit or, um, you know, for the broadcast to start or things like that? I think... Um, and I didn't touch upon this, but I think it's really important. And I'm glad you brought it up for waiting rooms. There's also like a, an important piece, especially in telemedicine of consent mm -hmm. is what is waiting for me behind this waiting room? Who are the other participants that are in the call? Am I okay with them joining and seeing me join as well? Um, yeah. any forms or terms and agreements that you want to that you want to have the the person that's joining as well. I also think it's a great place to let them know they're going to be recorded or what is being used um, in the in the call as well. So it's it's a great place for for that consent piece of it to to happen as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point on the consent. I, I really like that, and definitely, yeah, any medical visit and telehealth visits are no exception to that. You often have forms you've got to fill out, insurance you've got to confirm, how you're going to pay for this, all those things. So doing that in the waiting room is great. Um, I, I like implementing that into the workflow uh, as well. And and I think too, like you know, thinking about telemedical visits, you know, doctors, medical personnel, they're busy people. They're often late to the call. So being able to advise the patient that hey. You know, for the doctor to be able to send a quick message to them while they're in the waiting room, I'm running a few minutes behind, but I'll be there soon. Hang on, right? Things like that, too. I love it. Great. Thank you, Mariana. Um, all right. Let's go to another question here. Um, let's go to Afram, who says, is there any way to check users' internet speed before and while they're online and adjust the quality for that internet speed? So yeah, can any of our panelists talk a little bit about uh, checking internet speed before the call and can you be proactive once you know what it's like? Yeah, definitely. I think can be done, not only the internet speed, but you can measure other parameters as well. So it's not only about your bandwidth, there are other aspects. Could be that there is error rate caused by many other potential issues in your network mm -hmm. and the public network in general. So I think, um, yeah, there, there are ways that we have done in the past in some projects where we add stats and also feedback in different ways, depending also on the type of user no, we might have, because it's not the same if it's we are dealing with kids or with adults, you know. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a great point, too. Yeah. yeah depending on who is your user type, yeah. are you working <laughs> with with teenagers, with senior citizens? Yeah. yeah in a, is it a professional environment? Is it a is it a dating app or a exactly. gaming application, right? You know, all different demographics uh, and ways you might handle that. 
Yeah, so we can absolutely test. Oh, Go right, ahead, no, and Alberto, like you were saying, sometimes when we do our speed checks, there's also like package loss yeah, package and, loss. that we can check for and things like that. The other day we were in a call and Alberto was green and I was like, why are you green? <laughs> this is such a weird experience. And he's like, oh, this is because this is how they've chosen to ma handle package loss. So they're, uh, they, it's like half of the image is coming through. So there's definitely things that you can do to adjust for some of like those um, tricky pieces of connection. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's better approaches than making the boat. Actually, I will talk a bit about it in my oh, okay. Your side. Side. So, <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned to learn why Alberto is green. <laughs> yeah, so, so you can, in the tool, then try to do some things to automatically compensate of uh, the, you know, the individual bit rate of that participant versus others, perhaps, and or in a more extreme case, also, uh, be able to just say something like, hey, we think you should turn your camera off entirely or we're going to turn it off for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, or even, you know, maybe on the receiving side too for them that in a, in a group call, everybody else might see each other's videos, but maybe I don't see any of your videos because the tool knows that my bandwidth is the worst of the four of us. So it's going to downgrade my experience to be audio only, but but the rest of you shouldn't suffer for that perhaps, right? Yeah, we, we do that a lot with mobile too. Mm -hmm. um, for example, in desktop, we can show a certain number of videos at the same time, but that'll be too intense processing power on mobile. So we'll do speaker detection to only show the person that's speaking. Things like that is also how you adapt for like different viewports. Yeah, which is really important. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and you know, a lot of these things are things that like if you're using a CPaaS, uh, they'll have some of this functionality built into it, which is really nice. You as a developer don't have to deal with it as much. But for your use case, there might be uh, a very specific way you want to handle those situations that the CPaaS doesn't support. Maybe that's why you end up going with an open source media server or a CPaaS that has more flexibility in that. So these are good things to think about very early in the project as you're making your architectural choices as well of how do I how do I want to do this. So don't wait. Key point theme here perhaps of Mariana's presentation. Don't wait until you start getting user complaints to think about these things. Right? Exactly. Yeah. You need to think about this up front. It may affect your architecture as well. Yeah, small addition to that question, uh, to answer that question is that yeah, WebRTC handles actually that adapt that feed rate so yeah. based on what you have available the quality will, will not drop automatically but it adapts it in a way that is um it works well but it has some some issues like turning off of the camera that's not implemented in the standard so it's it's something that is embedded in webrdc for some situations but if you want to get more professional about it um yeah it needs some tweaking yeah Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, Alberto, let's go to you next uh, for our, our final presentation. Uh, so make sure you stick around for this and then we'll have a little more discussion after Alberto's presentation as well. So uh, speaking of quality, yeah. right? <laughs> Alberto is going to talk with us about high quality video limitations with WebRTC apps. Yep. So there are a few aspects that can influence, uh, that can limit the, uh, your WebRTC application. Uh, one is the encoding and decoding. Uh, the other one, network stability and bandwidth. There are more, but those are three main things that will limit your application. And when I'm talking here about high quality, I'm thinking about HD video quality and above, so 2K, 4K. And and basically, the idea to talk about it came from, from a past, uh, like, customers that were having questions about why we weren't supporting like 4K or why it's not like possible since I can watch my 4K video on YouTube, why you cannot do the same in WebRTC with WebRTC. So that that's my kind of explanation here on <laughs> what are those uh, limitations of us. So one, as I said, is encoding and decoding. So the encoding is basically the process where you have some video and it's um, the, the space or the it is kind of compressed so you need less bandwidth to transmit that data and that's 
very important for today's world. If, if you have limited bandwidth available, it's uh, critical to be able to compress the video, especially if it's high quality. So there are two aspects. There is the encoding, this is the part that um, encodes the video and sends it out, and the decoding that is uh, receiving the video and then displaying it in, in your application. The decoding part um, is usually more evolved and more up to date today. Um, it's what allows you in YouTube or other platforms to consume uh, 2K, 4K videos without problems. Also, they have buffers on it, so it's not live streaming. So that's obviously a benefit as well. But the encoding is the part that today is still a limitation, um, uh, as I explained here in these points, because you need more resources to be able to do it um, with higher qualities like 2K or 4K. So in this case, I did a run a quick test. And you need 50% more CPU usage to be able to stream in a more efficient codec today's AV1, the most um, popular one, or the, the, the codec that will become more popular in the future today is not as used because of this limitation. Um, also because it's only supporting Chrome today, um, but it will eventually be supported in Edge and Safari uh, for encoding. So that's kind of what is happening. Like we have our WebRTC application is it capable of decoding this very efficient AV1 codec, but encoding is, is hard. So if you have a, a very powerful machine or the new processors that you'll be designing this year or next year will be capable of hardware accelerating AV1, but it's something that is kind of happening or will happen in, in about a year that today your laptop might not have it. And then it means a lot of CPU, and then it means maybe you are not even capable of stream that. So that's one one limit there. And um, but yeah, the benefit will be huge because you will be able to stream 4K video as if it was just HD video. So like you are using the same bandwidth, and you are being able to send 4K. And today we are only able to send full HD. So it's. It's amazing to like a huge evolution, it will be like a good step. Um, but yeah, if you want, you can pass to the next one. The other one is obviously the, the network stability. And that's probably everyone we are familiar about. We were talking about before. Um, there are three um, like parameters that we look at usually. There is the latency, packet loss, and jitter. Latency is the delay, basically, that happens from the video sent and then being received at the other end, which can be quite annoying if there, it's more than one second. You kind of wait for answers or some person talks on top of the other. So that's the latency. And there is the packet loss, which is caused when there is conge congestion in the networks and happens. Well, there are many causes for that, but could happen even out of your your local network. So it could be the public network is being used a lot, like for a specific date, uh, and then it's all um, congested and there is a packet loss happening, causing also your the video quality to drop or even to have some um, uh, yeah weird uh, things like the green coloring <laughs> or things like that. And there is also the jitter, which is like a variance of um, it's a bit harder to explain, but yeah, it's basically a variance of how the packets are received. So you usually receive packets at a specific rhythm. And if one packet arrives sooner and another arrives a bit later, the, it could cause some glitches in the video. Um, and that was causes sometimes that you see a person talking and suddenly freezes and then continues. That could be a, a jitter problem. So those things happen no matter what. But there are some ways today to solve it. And actually, these things is what solving these problems will allow you to also achieve 4K qualities and things like that. And one thing very common that is used to solve it is points of presence very close to the user. So you avoid that video traffic to, like, that video traffic goes as little as possible through the public internet and as much as possible through your private um, internet. If obviously some, not all the companies have capabilities to build all this infrastructure, 
So you you can use um, cloud providers like AWS, and they have specific uh, services. Uh, there is the AWS Accelerator that allows you to connect to an entry point and just distribute that traffic internally through the AWS network. So that could be a, a way to um, reduce latency and packet loss because you control that traffic and and then you would be able then to have better qualities on the other end. Uh, next slide, please. And the uh, third uh, topic that wanted to mention that you need to take care of for high quality is the uh, limited bandwidth. We also talk a bit about it. Um, there are and touches a bit on Mariana's UI mm -hmm. uh, points, which is the dominant speaker identification. So we have limited bandwidth. We are using, uh, we know now that there are more efficient codecs to send more, but still um, there might happen situations where a specific participant cannot hear uh, because of drops in the bandwidth. And dominant speaker identification allows you to choose a specific video and, and just receive that one. The other point uh, that you can use to, to improve um, quality, well, improve the, the quality of your application is to use adaptive bitrate. Um, so you could choose, uh, and based on the resolution, so you could choose to reduce the, the amount of uh, bandwidth and video that you send based on the resolution the, the user has. So if I have like a large screen, I would uh, be receiving more uh, like higher quality video than in, than in a phone. So you, you, don't, you, you want to optimize the resources and you want the user also to not request more if he doesn't need it. And the, la the third point is the simulcast or SVC, which are some techniques that allow you to distribute um, traffic uh, for different types of users. So you want to use that if one user has very good bandwidth connection, very low packet loss and so on, like they, they have ideal network and the other has a very poor network, you would like to be able to distribute that and send the right, uh, like good quality to one and bad quality to the other. And that's what um, SBC allows in this image. I'm showing it just how you send like uh, like a high quality video. So it could be like 2K or 4K that you're sending, but then maybe a specific user can only handle like lowest, like 720p and that's that would be fine. He could consume that and the other user could be consuming uh, a higher quality. So those, those are some, some things to consider, but um, yeah, there are of course more. <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's all I have today. Okay, great. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, yeah, a lot of great tips there. I think, uh, high, I mean, all of this really comes together in terms of how we manage applications at a larger scale as people are using these more and more. These things matter more. And on, on the one hand, we're maybe as a user base a little more tolerant of some problems and calls in, in like a video conference, for example, as, as I was saying earlier. But especially depending on the use case, we may have zero tolerance for it. You know, in a telemedical call, very difficult. In a broadcast, we expect the broadcast to be basically perfect quality where it's, it's one way, essentially, even in an interactive broadcast where we bring a participant on stage who's remote, we expect that quality to be perfect as well. So really important to uh, uh, think about all of these things and be able to incorporate it into your application. Uh, we have a, a, a couple of questions from our audience that we'll wrap up with uh, and then share with you uh, the much anticipated mention, the ChatGBT song written uh, by ChatGBT and our own Hector uh, Zelaya. Uh, but first, a couple more questions to close out here. Uh, so let's go to here. Uh, Ricardo uh, wants to know about the difference between open source WebRTC servers or do we need to pay for a third party service. So there are definitely options there, you know, between those, but maybe I could get, you know, a quick, quick summary of, of uh, a quick couple of thoughts from you all on why you might go with open source or a commercial CPaaS solution. What are some of the trade-offs to consider? 
Yeah, I think I will start with some points and maybe Justin can add on, on that. I think the definitely if you don't have the, the team, like if you don't have a technic large technical team or the amount of resources required, um, a third party service, a paid service is the way to go. Um, you need to know that an open source web RTC service um, is free, but it is not free out back. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, there are things that needs needs to be improved and also you need to maintain on your infrastructure so those are important things to consider but of course there are great open source uh, servers that we have used in production that are being used in production so um, I think the open source developers are doing like a great job in in all those like Janus, um, Pion, mm -hmm. yeah, um, live care, live, live yeah. sweeps. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's one of those, it's, it's a, it's definitely a question with no right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. You know, there's very much a trade off, uh, around those different decisions to make anything you want to add to that. Yeah, just one way or another, you're going to have to pay for something. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there is no free. Yeah. 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 Scaling web RTC reality. is probably the hardest, I would say one of the hardest problems, uh, to solve. Yeah. And yeah, relying on a CPaaS for that aspect, um, it's hugely sure. beneficial and allows you to accelerate your application development, which is great. And then maybe that's something that you can consider in the long term. Okay, are we are we still good with the CPaaS, or do we want to move to something open source for more custom behavior? Yeah, but yeah, definitely tons of trade offs. Yeah, yeah, and that's a really good point too, Justin. That it's not a decision you have to make once and never change your mind yeah. on. There's always a cost and change, of course, but it may be appropriate to start with one path and then switch to another over time. And then there's some things like like LiveKit that have both an open source and a CPaaS version too that you can look at. Um, there are even hybrid approaches that we have heard of. And that's true, like yeah. You, you experiment with both, maybe you start experimenting with open source and you keep it as your core infrastructure and then you have these third party platforms that allow you to scale um, mm -hmm. to huge amounts of participants, so yeah. Yeah, it's not unusual for a, a client to ask us to maybe switch from one provider to another based on their experience with their specific use case uh, or to even implement both and have like kind of failover scenarios or use one in one type of situation and another with another. Uh, so uh, moving on to a question here for you, Alberto, from Guillermo. Uh, wants, it says, uh, Alberto, is encoding and decoding performed on a server or uh, on the client in their browser? On both. <laughs> so it's, yes. it's used, yes. it's used um, for transmitting uh, media in a more efficient manner. So basically, any point to point communication um, will need to encode and decode. And it happens. So basically, um, it's sent from the client point of view, you are encoding. But from the server, the good part is that you control the server. You can have just a huge server that is capable of encode and decode the code AV1 and very modern codecs. The problem is you don't control the clients. And that's that's kind of the limitation there. Like if someone has a old, like five-year-old Android phone, <laughs> it's like you, you need to work with that and how you encode like high quality video with that. It's, it's not possible. So you need to yeah, find ways to do that. Yeah. All right, and uh, we'll just wrap up with one more one more question here uh, as we're running out of time. Uh, again, Alberto, uh, any particular SFUs that uh, implement Simulcast and SVC that you know, someone could use to try this out with? Yeah, there are a couple that I know I think could be the LifeKit uh, has it. Uh, so, yeah. And Janus does as Janus, well. Janus, yeah, definitely. Um, Media Soup, I would say also. Um, I don't know if both, um, because yeah, Simulcast is a bit different than SVC, although the goal is kind of the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it just works different, but basically the goal is to be able to send different qualities to yeah. participants. So yeah. Um, yeah, definitely I would check out yeah, Media Soup, Janus, um, LifeKit, those are good options. But I mean, there are others too, if, if you have other preferred. <laughs> programming languages. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today for your questions. Thanks especially to my panelists, to my colleagues here, Justin and Mariana, Alberto. Thank, Thank you. you again for being here in person. I wish we could do this in person every month. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
you know, we're WebRTC developers. We have to eat our own dog food and work remotely too, right? Exactly. Otherwise, we wouldn't, time, yeah. we wouldn't know about the bad UX of muting if we didn't have to deal with it ourselves sometimes. Uh, but uh, it is great to be here together in person. Uh, really appreciate that. And thanks to all of you joining us uh, live today on Weber, uh, WebRTC Live. Uh, as always, the video of this episode will be available on the WebRTC Ventures YouTube channel. And we'll also be blogging about this on our site at webrtc.ventures, and you can learn more about all of these topics that we've discussed. Our next episode of WebRTC Live will be Wednesday, May 24th. My guest will be Court Shewitt from the Amazon Chime SDK team, so definitely check that out. To find out more about any of our upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at WebRTC Ventures, on Twitch, on LinkedIn, YouTube, and go to webrtc.ventures and join our email list. And so finally, as promised, uh, this is 2023. We're, 2023, we're recording this. It is the year of, of uh, AI, uh, certainly the trending topic. So to close today's episode, we have this one more special treat, as I mentioned, and this is also up on our blog at webrtc.ventures. Hector Zelaya from our team uh, did a little uh, exercise with ChatGBT where he gave it a prompt about let's make it live, asked it to write some lyrics, and then uh, being musically talented himself, he took it to the next step and composed re and recorded and made this little uh, even video for us. So we're going to close with that song about making it live. Thank you all for joining us today. Let's make it live. Yeah.
For joining us for WebRTC Live, visit our website at webrtc.ventures to learn more about our custom design and development services and to learn more about upcoming episodes of WebRTC Live.